Now, one thing I love about the Bible, especially the New Testament, is a word in the Greek that is pronounced dunamis. We've heard of that word dunamis, right? Dunamis. If, if you're like, why is he speaking Greek? Um, your Bible is written partly in Greek. Your New Testament is partly Greek and Aramaic. And why is that important? Because it wasn't written in English thousands of years ago. It was written in a different language that meant different things. These languages are much deeper um, than our surface level version of English that we carry around these days. So it means something dunamis. When you read the New Testament, most of the time you see the word power It's dunamis. That's the word that the author used, dunamis. It means explosive. Dynamite is where we get the the translation dunamis from. Dynamite. It's explosive in nature. It's powerful. It's exciting. It's exhilarating. It's shocking. And uh, we love that, don't we? We love explosiveness just in general, right? We absolutely do. Uh, we, We love when things are blowing up. Most of us love when things blow up for the wrong reasons. <laughs> I appreciate the giggles on that. <laughs> Most of us like drama because it's explosive. And we might say we don't enjoy drama, but our life perpetuates the reality that we keep going after this explosiveness of drama. We like when things blow up. And the mature ones in the room, we like when things blow up for the right reasons. We like when things are ignited, caught on fire, especially in the ways of the Lord, when a service just turns into what we call revival. It's just like those revival services, like we live for that. I live for that. When I see people come to an altar of prayer that have not ever came or haven't came in years, I live for that because I know there's a fire stirring on the inside of them that God is pushing them to experience something explosive and powerful that will strengthen them to the very spirit. I love, I love, I love blowing things up. You know what I mean? I just, I just love, I'm a pyrotechnic at heart, Dustin. I just, I really am. I really am. This one time in in high school, it's unfortunate. I was in high school. I wish I was like smaller. Uh, This one time in high school, me and uh, one of my best friends, Kevin, Rev Kev, Pastor Kevin of the Real Men Ministry, we were talking on the phone, like a home phone. It wasn't the cell phone. Anybody remember the home phones? (laughs) <laughs> I was talking on a home phone, and it was a nice one. It was wireless. Like, you know, it didn't have the cord on it. It was, it was wireless, and it, it was kind of new. And me and Kevin were just talking shop. We're just talking about cars and trucks and all this stuff, you know what I mean? And I'm talking to him, and I'm standing in the kitchen just leaning against the bar. Um, I swear I have not been drinking. <laughs> I about fell there. I was leaning against the bar. Maybe I shouldn't call it that either. I uh, don't want to imply anything. Um, I do not drink, especially in high school, do not drink. I looked at the microwave and I was talking on the phone with Kevin. And I think I've probably told this story a few times. Um, And I I was just like, hey Kevin, one second, I'm gonna do something, let me know what you hear. (laughs) I take the phone, I put it in the microwave and I turn it on, like, I don't, I don't believe Christians can be possessed by demons, but I believe they can be oppressed and guided. And in that moment, I think it was the devil trying to blow something up because I actually was just like, is this thing going to blow? Like, it was odd. It was out of character. And I turn it on, and I expected something wild, and I, and I got one little spark. Praise the, praise the Lord of all creation. I got one little spark, and then, it, and then I hit stop, and I'm just like, that's, that's it? And I grabbed the phone to go ask to see what Kevin heard, and the phone was dead, of course. But I, I expected a big explosion for drama's sake. I expected something big and large. I, I, I love when things blow up. About a year ago, I got obsessed with um, a man named Robert Oppenheimer, um, who, um, you know, decades ago pushed go. He was the scientist behind the first atom bomb. And I'm really behind all of atomic warfare, nuclear warfare. I got a little bit obsessed with, with him and, and what he was doing. And I got really obsessed about the ins and outs of explosions. And the Lord brought that to my memory 
Um, this week when I was thinking about power, when I was thinking about dunamis, that, that, that in, the, in the decades ago, they were creating these atom bombs out of, you've, you've probably heard of uranium and plutonium, um, especially if you're really afraid of Russia, you've heard of those things. These, these, are ty- these are types of elements that when you take like a uranium atom, for instance, and you take another uranium atom and you shoot them at each other, it creates an explosion and a chain reaction of explosions. It's very dramatic. The thing about it is it's called fission. Say fission with an F. Fission. Fission. That's the type of nuclear reaction that is happening in an atom bomb. Takes one atom and shoots it at the other to literally divide it and destroy it to then create a chain reaction of more divided and destroyed atoms that Robert Oppenheimer and Einstein himself were afraid that it would create a chain reaction so bad when one atom bomb went off that it would catch the entire atmosphere of earth on fire. That's how much they were afraid of the small chance that this chain reaction of of destruction could get out of control. Fission divides and destroys to cause success in an explosion. Today I want to talk about the mission, and I find that interesting in the English, that fission and mission kind of rhyme, because I think the enemy is on mission to divide you. I think the enemy is on mission to shoot you with what God has set up as your mission to divide you and to break you down. We were talking in the huddle this morning just about this idea, and most of you sitting in the seats, and I'd be in the same boat if I was in the seats, I'm the same boat up here, most of us have tasted a little bit, we've seen a little bit of the mission that Jesus has for us. We have. Even if you're running around saying, I don't know what God's calling me to do, no, you actually do, because he made you for it. And he set it up in front of you so you can see it and step into it. But when a lot of us step into our, we call it callings. I don't like the word calling. I like assignments. Say assignment. Assignment. When a lot of us step into our God-given assignment, it feels like a sword is hitting us at points. It feels like, God, you called me to this, but why isn't it working like just perfectly? Why isn't it working grand? Why, why, God, when you call me to preach the gospel to my friends and family, why do they reject me? Why why do my kids not listen to my teaching? When you set me up as a parent, why, why when I sign up to serve at church in any given Area, why do I step in and it just doesn't feel right? Why does it feel like it's just tension, just pushing against the very spirit that God gave? I don't understand. Let me help you understand today. God has given you a mission, and it's very clear. It's so clear that the enemy knows what your mission from God is. And the enemy believes way more in God than you do. He does. He believes if you grab a hold of the mission of God and make it part of yourself and take off in the name of Jesus like Saul in the Bible, then big things will happen. But if the enemy can take your mission that God said is for you to do and make it your enemy to collide against you and break you down, that's what the enemy wants to do with your mission. He wants to tear you apart with your calling. I've been here for... 24 years since I was 10 years old, and I've, I've seen hundreds if not thousands of people come in here and leave. Not just as simple as that, but come in here and receive a call, receive an assignment from God. The church is excited. Oh my gosh, we finally have somebody that can build a website. We finally have somebody that can teach the fourth graders on a Wednesday night. We finally have somebody. God has brought us somebody. Where did they go though? They got inside of their mission and the devil turned it against them and split them up. And you can look at their their lives and their lives is full of fallout. Fallout. Just like when the atom bomb went off twice during the war, killed tens of thousands of people on impact, 
But the fallout, the radiation poisoning killed hundreds of thousands of people in the coming days in weeks. Do you notice when somebody leaves Jesus or leaves church, gets church hurt and leaves for whatever reason they put on it, all of a sudden their life just becomes this big cloud of poison, this big cloud of a mess. It gets worse and worse and worse and people around them start falling away. Maybe they, get a, maybe they split. Maybe their kids leave and never come back. May, maybe they lose their job. Maybe they lose their business. Maybe they lose everything they have and fall out from listening to the devil about their mission. See, the devil wants to take your life, split it up, and blow it up for drama's sake. <laughs> for drama's sake. He already knows that Jesus won the war. He's read the end of the book more than we have. He knows every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, including him. He knows that Jesus is going to get his glory. So he just does this for drama's sake, to blow your life up, just to hurt the heart of God and to hurt the children of God and to hurt the people that were designed to be children of God that he keeps at bay and might never become children of God because he flips their vision and creates an exploding mess out of it. What if today you could live explosively just in a more positive way than you're used to? Instead of seeing something you don't like at school or on in the community or at church and immediately grabbing your cell phone to start the drama train of explosion chain reaction, what if you could actually be the one who is just like, oh God, you have given me eyes to see this problem. What if I start a prayer chain instead? What if I go to the people that I know I can trust that are praying people of God and say, hey, I see this. I don't know what's going on, but let's pray about it because I'm here for unity, not division. Before the end of this day, we need to really understand what we are for. I don't care if you stamp the label of Christian on yourself today. What's your fallout look like? Is your fallout a mess of destruction? Or is your fallout different? In, in Acts chapter 9, we see Paul step into this thing. And my title is uh, Fuse It or Lose It, by the way. It's kind of cute. We'll play on words. You know, use it or lose it. It's an interesting point. A lot of people leave church because they were used by the church. Isn't that what you prayed for God to do? God, use me. (laughs) Oh my gosh, they just keep asking me to do stuff. Yeah, that's what you asked for. It's what you signed up for. But the devil, like a wolf in sheep's clothing, headed you off from your flock and started talking and saying, man, you're bigger than this. Your mission is better than this. Your mission's more glamorous than this. They don't understand you. That pastor doesn't, he doesn't hold you high enough. And very quickly you can be like, yeah, the, that, that first initial mission from Jesus is not good for me. So I'll go do my own thing. But today I want to talk from this idea of fuse it or lose it. And we come into verse 20 here, it kind of, it goes quickly. It literally says the word, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues saying, he is the son of God. Immediately after what? Immediately after what we read last week, when his scales were removed from his eyes, when he had a three day encounter with the Holy Spirit, when, when Ananias A believer who did not want to step into that mission, but he did it because he obeyed God and he believed the vision of Jesus to seek and save the lost. When the the Holy Spirit said, Ananias, go to Saul in a vision. Saul's already seen a vision of you. Go to him and lay hands on him. Bring him into the family. Get him filled up with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Ananias is like, I don't want to do that. That's the man that's been killing my brothers and sisters. And we see him go and do it anyway on mission for Jesus. And he obeyed and said, brother Saul. So I loved it that we see towards the end of this passage that the disciples in Jerusalem, the Peters, the Johns, the James, They looked at Saul and called him brother as well because they're on mission for Jesus. That's when immediately Saul gets up 
in Damascus and starts preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's fallout. When something was ignited in his soul from the very fire of God, it exploded and fallout occurred. And the fallout was, I immediately have to preach the gospel. I immediately have to preach the good news. It doesn't matter who I was. It doesn't matter where I came from. I still live with a lot of that baggage. But man, this fire is so intense. It feels like it became a part of me. It feels like maybe I became a new creation fused with the Spirit of God. And I have to preach the gospel. I have to let it out. And it said immediately after his scales fell from his eyes, after he got over himself over the past, and the Holy Spirit ignited him in explosive dunamis power so that he immediately went out and preached the gospel. So he went into the synagogues where his former brothers of the Jewish faith were teaching the Torah, reading their scriptures, doing their prayers. Saul of Tarshish walks in and says, Jesus is Lord. Imagine the confusion there. You know, I get it. They say, you know, the devil's the author of confusion. It says it. <laughs> I, I, I get that because the devil takes that confusion and perpetuates it and makes it worse like a chain reaction. But Jesus says, you, you'll be peculiar to the world. It had to be awfully peculiar for Saul of Tarshish to walk into a synagogue and say, Jesus is Lord. Whoa, 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 whoa. Four days ago, we heard you were coming to Damascus to kill these Christians that say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is really Lord, Saul? Jesus is Lord. And it said that he proved that Jesus was the Christ through his preaching. Oh, Jonathan, I'm not learned enough in the ways of Jesus. I haven't, I haven't read enough commentaries by the greats of Christianity. I didn't go to seminary. I can't even spell seminary. And you think that I can step into preaching the word of Jesus? A one-day-old Christian named Saul of Tarsus stood up and said, Jesus is Lord, and that proved he was the Christ to the people in the crowd. You might not feel qualified to walk in your assignment. That's inconsequential, my friends. You don't need to feel, if you feel qualified, you're arrogant. If you feel like you were ready to do this in your own flesh, in your own mind, in your own intellect, no, 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 you're still on your own mission. Just like two weeks ago, Saul was still on his own mission because he knew what he knew was the right thing to do. We need to squash this heretical church they call the way, they call the Christians. We need to squash them because I know what the Torah says. He was a teacher of the law, rising up in the Pharisee movement. And when he, the scales fell from his eyes, I believe that arrogance fell of like, I don't know as much as I thought I knew. And what I knew seems to be changing, seems to be pushing me into a different direction. And he accepted it. Knocked him off his pony. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Get up, go into town, and wait for me to tell you what to do. And that's what he did. And then when he told him what to do, he immediately got up and started preaching the gospel. And the fallout was the proving of Jesus is the Christ. We can't prove God. That's what I hear constantly in this modernistic, sarcastic language. There's no way we can prove God. Paul did. So that he proved that Jesus was the Christ to these people and in their hearts. His immediate fallout was the gospel being preached. And I absolutely love that. He went from wreaking havoc to pushing life in the kingdom of God onto planet earth. I absolutely love that. Saul was on mission immediately. He grew in strength, the scripture said, said that he confounded the religious leaders. The religious leaders of Judaism, he confounded them with his words, and then he was persecuted. This is where we feel divided. This is where we feel cut down by our mission and assignment. I'm telling you, like, 
Preaching is funny. <laughs> and that is not a true statement. That was very sarcastic, I guess. It just kind of came out. Preaching's peculiar. I feel within my bones one billion percent on assignment to be a preacher of the word of God. But when I do it, there's swords flying at me. Yeah. He knows. <laughs> he knows. There's swords flying at your head when you're preaching the word of God. And you have to decide what to do with those swords. Was that sword meant to cut me down? Or was it meant to penetrate my soul so I can see something? Was it meant to poison me? Was that fallout from the enemy? Or, or was that something that I was meant to ingest, eat the meat and spit out the bones? What, what was that sword? And I, and, I, and, I, and I know this to be true. This isn't just in preaching. This is in every single mission that the Lord could give any single one of us. You might be called to open a door in the lobby and smile at people when the wrong person walks through that door and doesn't reciprocate that feeling of thankfulness. You know, it's almost Thanksgiving, goodness gracious, and they did not smile at me. They did not say thank you. It feels like a sword right in your heart, and you have to decide, who are you doing this for, yourself, them, or God? Who are you doing this for? Who am I preaching for? Am I preaching for myself? Am I preaching to glorify Jesus and, and see the lost become found? Who am I doing this for? So I have learned that I've had to take the persecution. I've had to take the swords. That's what Paul was going through. He had to take the persecution. He did not look at it like an attack from God. He did not look at it like, oh, um, um, this is definitely the wrong mission because it's not going good. Even though that's how we live our lives. If it's not going good, we want to quit because it must not be right if it's not going good. It must not be God if it's not going good. Saul of Tarsus, one day into his faith, realized something. Oh, this is what persecution feels like on the other side. This is what's going on here. Maybe that persecution you're feeling, maybe that pressure you're feeling isn't from God trying to say you're doing the wrong thing, but it's from the enemy saying, oh man, she's doing the right thing. I need to stop her. Oh man, he's doing the right thing that's going to build him up in strength. I need to stop him. Oh man, I need to divide them down and, and blow this thing up with some drama. I need to divide them down and blow this thing up with some violence so I can create some more followers for me. You see, that's how the devil gains followers, is by cutting you in two. Some of you just have split personalities because the devil cuts you in two. Some of you, some of you deal with bipolarism just because the devil cuts you in two and you believed it. I'm not, I'm not generalizing statements here. I'm not a medical professional by no means. I'm just saying what I'm feeling right now from the spirit of the Lord. Some of you feel like you're living 35 lives because you are, because the devil has just cut you up and then he just let it go. He walked away. It's one thing to blame it on the devil, but the devil ain't even with you anymore. He just hit Go. He just blew you up and walked away because he knew the fallout would be death, destruction, and defeat of you. Paul looked at the persecution and he, and he just said, this is what it is. I'm not going to lay down and take it, but I'm not going to blame God for it, and I'm not going to quit. Why did you not succeed in that ministry assignment that you had? I'm talking to everybody I'm not talking to preachers and pastors and apostles and prophets and all that. I'm talking to everybody who has the Spirit of God on the inside of you for at least one day. Why did you believe? Why did you believe that you should quit? Why did you quit? Why did it not work out? This is simple logic of the universe. The only people that succeed are the people that don't quit. It's, it's, it's simple. Why did you not succeed in that man? Well, because it wasn't for me. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't buy that anymore. I don't buy that. If God led you to it, he'll lead you through it. He won't lead you to quit. He'll lead you to higher places. Yeah. Oh, you know, I was called to kids, but, you know, six weeks in, I was really, I'm feeling the Lord is calling me to lead worship. <laughs> that sounds more fun. It's like, yeah, maybe so, but why don't you let the Lord lead you through your mission that you're on? where he can look at you and say, you have completed this mission. 
I've set you up for something higher, but we want to quit. Jump ship and pick what we want to pick. He was persecuted, cut down, but he did not accept the division. We have to be a people that stops accepting the division that is thrown our way. Just like a fission bomb, they're throwing atoms together so that they blow up. I find it so interesting, and this is just right now the Spirit of the Lord. You know where the, the word atom comes from for the particle. Adam, man, Adam in your Bible, in Genesis, in the Torah, is the word Adam in Hebrew, which means man. How many of you have left a church? How many of you have left this church mad at another man or a woman? Did you hear what they said about me? Did you see how they looked at, did you, did you see, did you see how the enemy is pitting us against each other? Do, do you believe that decision that that pastor and that board made? Can you believe? Division, division, division. And if you have a chain reaction when division hits you and it's a fallout of death, destruction, gossip, slander, all of those things, you are on mission for the enemy, my friends. But if you don't buy the division, if you fight for unity, your fallout will look a lot different. I find it so beautiful when Paul, Saul was persecuted. It says that his disciples gathered him up, got a hole in the wall of the city, and dropped him down in a basket. There's a lot there that I want to unpack for you, but I can't. The one thing that I want to highlight, though, is says his disciples. Said many days later, there's been some time in between the immediately preaching, the persecution happening. Persecution wasn't just on day one, and hey, let's get Paul, let's get Saul out of town. Sorry if I'm confusing you, calling him two different names. He has a Hebrew name, Saul, and a Greek name, Paul. The Bible switches it in a few chapters. Let's get him out of town. His disciples. Paul had disciples already. Paul preached the gospel, and when it, within weeks or months, he had his own disciples that had the Spirit of God in them, and wisdom enough to know we, we don't lay down for division. We don't lay down for the sword of the enemy. We stand up, and we go where the Lord is calling us to go. And they got Paul out of town, and they, they got him to Jerusalem, where the big church was where the big dog apostles and disciples were. Peter, James, and John, the best friends of Jesus, were there in Jerusalem. And it says they, that Paul came in and said that he wanted to join. Say join. Join. He wanted to unite. He wanted to come together with the disciples. He didn't want to start his own thing. If you do an analysis of your New Testament, Paul wrote a majority of it. He was a boss. He was a savant. He was a linguistic. He knew literature. He, he, he was modern. He, he was edgy. He was straight to the truth. He, he, he was and is to this day on the Mount Rushmore of Christianity if we had one. But he didn't go to the disciples and say, hey, I want to start my own brand. I need my own logo, you know what I mean? Like an S2P. Saul to Paul. <laughs> Pray for me, I'm crazy. He, he didn't say, I want to start my own brand of Christianity, cool. No, he said, I wanted to join the brotherhood. I wanted to join the assembly of believers. I wanted to join the disciples and be part of what Jesus himself started through. Them. He recognized the authority on earth that Jesus set up. He went there, and the disciples themselves were afraid of him, which I would have been too. The chief executor, the chief persecutor of the church, all of a sudden is coming to the church and saying, can I join up? When's growth track? 
When's the membership class? Is there a new believers course that I can go through? I've already been preaching, but it's like <laughs> I, need to, I need to graft myself in to you and, and, and join you. And like I said, the disciples were afraid, but it says, but Barnabas. But Barnabas stepped in. We left Barnabas back a half a dozen chapters or so in the book of Acts. Barnabas was amazing. They gave him a new name, Barnabas. He, he was rising up in the ranks of the disciples. He, he, he sold his land and gave all of his money to the church when Ananias and Sapphira said they were doing the same thing and they actually lied about it. And they got struck down dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit about it. Barnabas was the one that stood there and was just like, I really did, I promise. <laughs> Barnabas stepped up. He was a man of courage, a man of God. And he steps up again for Saul, the chief persecutor of the church. The Lord spoke to me in this as the church needs to become fighters for those who were once against it. The church does not need to build these walls of anybody who's scary and keep them out. We need to bust down the walls and go preach the gospel and bring everybody in no matter where they came from, no matter what they did to even us. Barnabas is like, no, 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 guys, my friends, apostles, disciples, you haven't heard what Saul's been doing? He went to Damascus to kill our people, our brothers and sisters, and the Lord met him on the road. Jesus did, and he actually spoke. Spoke to Saul. You see, that's kind of the delineation between the, the, the first apostles and all the secondary apostles all the way to us is, is they lived with Jesus. They saw Jesus face to face, and that was something different. That was something unique. And that might still happen to this day in miraculous situations. I've never seen Jesus face to face. Oh God, I want to. And I know I will in glory, but I'd love to right now. There's some roads that I drive down like, Lord, I need that. <laughs> I, don't, I haven't gotten that yet, but Saul did. You, did you, you hadn't heard that. He saw Jesus face to face and called him, assigned him to be the preacher to the Gentiles. Don't you remember? Don't you remember? Jesus said, go therefore to all of the nations. Beyond where we are at, beyond Judea, beyond this Galilean countryside that we're standing on, go to Samaria, go to the uttermost ends of the earth. He called Saul by his own voice to be that guy. You ever heard he's been preaching and people getting saved? You ever heard that he's been preaching and people getting healed? You have not heard of the multitudes of people that have came to Jesus because of Saul? You haven't heard that yet? Well, let me tell you, it's the truth. He stood up for Saul, and he didn't just say, you know, Saul's a good guy. He'd been doing devotions four days a week. Barnabas says that's, like, very positive. He, he didn't just say these little things. He says, no, 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 no. He's been proving that Jesus is the Christ by the things and the way that he lives. He's been fulfilling the vision of Jesus by the mission that he is executing. Oh, I find that so beautiful. Imagine Saul standing there in front of all of those men who he's heard about. All these men that can heal people with Jesus not even in the room anymore. All these men that have preached on the day of Pentecost and thousands were added unto him. Imagine sitting across from Peter going, oh my gosh, that's Pete. When he preached, 3,000 men were saved and they all started speaking. They were talking in different languages, and they all understood the gospel. That's Pete. And 3,000 were added to the church that day. Added. Man, God added through that Peter. And imagine the flip Peter looking at Paul. He's the one that divided. He's the one that cut us down, but Jesus has a different plan for him. So they accepted him, called him brother, 
And he started preaching in and out of the Jerusalem synagogues. He started going in and out of disciples in Jerusalem. It was home base. It was home camp. And it said again that the Jews started persecuting. The Jews started to put a hit on him. The Jews wanted to cut him down. And it says the brothers, the apostles, the disciples said, we got to save Paul. He is God's chosen instrument. We got to save him. So they gathered him up and they sent him home to Tarshish. Making a missionary. We think missionaries go to Uganda, Papua New Guinea, and China, and Japan. They do. But first they go home. First they go home. And they learn how to preach the gospel to those that they live with. They learn how to love and care for the people that they live with. They don't get to just skip town and go love some other people that are easier to love. It's easy to love strangers. It's hard to love family. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, we're praying for family time at the altar here. Okay, and I'm going into Thanksgiving. No, he said, they, they sent him home to Tarshish. But there's, the end of this passage intrigues me so much. Verse 31 says, So the church, after they sent him home, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up in walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It multiplied multiplied when Christians got on mission. Multiplied when Christians started forgiving some people that were against them at one point. Multiplied. It didn't just add all of a sudden. On the day of Pentecost, thousands were added to the church. But all of a sudden, when the church comes together in unity and not in division, multiplication starts happening. That's what we see with Saul, who most of us know as Paul the Apostle is accepted into the brotherhood and becomes the first missionary to the Gentiles. Multiplication begins to happen. Division gets put to the side. We got bombs now that have power. And they were being built at the same time that the the atom bombs that would divide to create a chaotic chain reaction. They were being built at the same time. We've heard of the hydrogen bomb, yeah? Yeah. The hydrogen bomb doesn't use fission that breaks down to explode and cause death. The hydrogen bomb used something we call fusion. And you've all heard of it. Fusion, nuclear fusion. So when you take a hydrogen isotope and another hydrogen isotope, and instead of pitting them against each other to create breaking, you fuse them together. And that creates a chain reaction of power, an explosion. That's what the church is supposed to be. The church is a bunch of little different pieces of the puzzle, a lot of different parts in the body that are supposed to come together in unification to create multiplication. And the fallout of hydrogen bombs, you set one off right now. I heard an astrophysicist talking about it the other day. You set one off right now, somebody's like, if Korea, if China, if Russia puts off an atom bomb over there because of all this nonsense that's going on over there, is is that radiation poisoning going to reach the USA and kill us all? No. That's not how they're designed. There won't be any of that with those types of fusion bombs. The fruit of fusion is power, chain reaction of power, power, power. Does this church that I'm standing in right now, are we riding a chain reaction of power and power and power where it doesn't lead to death, destruction, and division? There's a lot of churches out there. They rely on dictatorship as the pastor. Dictatorship as the board, dictatorship as the staff, dictatorship as ministry leaders, dividing and cutting, and we can grow really big, but don't you know that cancer can grow? We know that. I know it all too well. Doesn't mean it's healthy. Doesn't mean it's together when its aim is to divide and break down. The church has to be the one movement on earth that is unified 
in one accord, just like in the book of Acts. There will be fallout in your life from following Jesus. Do you hear me? You will have fallout. And it should be multiplication. The fruit of a Christian is more Christians. Saul became a Christian days, weeks, months later. He had more Christians following him around, trying to learn from him. And I understand that we're not all called to be apostles in nature, but we are called to be formed into disciples who make disciples who make disciples. So I want to give you some takeaways this morning before we leave this place. As we walk into our week of Thanksgiving, um, it's going to be a good opportunity (laughs) for most of us to get into rooms with people that we know and love but don't agree with. We know and love and typically walk away from the dinner table and, you know, with division. Deviled eggs and division. Something about Thanksgiving, you know what I mean? I want to give you some takeaways here today. How do you view the mission that you have been given? Think about that. Do you see it as a burden against you or a bomb against the enemy? Challenge this week is to get on the same page with Jesus, all of us, all of us, all of us, me included. I'm doing this. I got a little head start because I knew this was coming, but I'm doing this. Jesus, am I on your same page? Am I actually on mission for you or am I on mission for me? How do we do that? Go home. Most of you are going to go home at some point today, yeah? Go home. The disciples said, Paul, Saul, go to Tarshish. Go home. Figure this stuff out with the Lord. It's it's interesting. Paul's the same person that said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Go in the fear of the Lord. Walk in the name of Jesus and you will have multiplication. So we got to go home and buy into the vision of Jesus to seek and save the lost. Some of us are not bought into that and it's clear through the missions that we are living in our lives. Buy into the vision. Practical stuff here. Don't check out. I know you check out when I was talking science earlier. It's cool. I expected it. I'm not hurt by it at all. I'm going to do what I do, baby. (laughs) But pay attention. I need you to get on the same page with Jesus this week. Write out the mission he's given you. The things that you have felt or feel assigned to by the Lord to do, but maybe you felt dividing you when you tried to do it or when you've just thought about it, it feels hard, like I felt like I was supposed to actually help the kids' ministry, not just because lead pastor got up there and made us feel bad about it, but I actually felt a calling, a push to be assigned to that, but there's not. It's like I don't, I don't like that. Or I've had dreams about doing this ministry or doing this, being this kind of Christian, but the amount of time it would require seems unrealistic. If that's you, I want to give you confirmation. The time that Jesus required is unrealistic to our human thinking because he requires all of it. I'm not saying you got to quit your job, but when you go to your job, who are you working for? Are you doing this as worship unto the Lord? Are you doing this just to cash a paycheck so if time, if time is the thing that's been cutting you down, oh, I ain't paid, so I'm not going to work four hours outside of church time. I'd like for you to, on your journal, on your Google Doc or whatever, when you're writing out your mission, write out your excuses and write out the things that you're actually willing to put the time into right now that is not the ministry that God has called you to. I'm going to be very honest. I can, I, can, I can do 10, 12 hours a week on movies or books or things like that. I, 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 but if it sacrifices from where God has called me to be on mission for, that's a very big problem. 
And I need to realize I need to sacrifice and cut out some things that I don't need so I can be in unity with Jesus. So write all that stuff down. Write down the times where you should have shared the gospel with your friend or that stranger or your family member. Write down why you didn't. What were you afraid of? Were you afraid of their rejection? Were you afraid of not knowing enough? What were you afraid of? Write it all down and then take it to God. Take that mission to God. Take all those little missions to God and just say yes. That's my challenge this week. I'm not telling you to take it to your therapist. I'm not t- telling you to take it to your best friend. I'm telling you to take the, all of this to God after you go home and process it and say, God, all of these things, the gifts, the callings that are irrevocable, says the word of God, I say yes to. I say yes to. And if we do that, my friends, if we say yes to the mission of Jesus, multiplication will happen. If we say yes to the vision of Jesus and walk out his mission, multiplication will happen. Instead of having to have two homes because you're thinking about a divorce, what if one home became unified? Instead of wondering what the next thing that God has for me, what if I step into the very thing that he's placed in front of me when I was born? Stop chasing the nice and shiny, bright stuff. And run into the thing that he has right in front of you. Instead of failing in ministry, dream after dream because of fear. What if the the mission getting accomplished and fulfilling the dream of Jesus was enough for us? What if Jesus was enough for us? At the end of this series, I want to end it like this before we pray. When I start praying, altar team can come and we're going to have an altar call. I want to pray about your callings. I want to pray about your assignments. I want to pray about the God dreams that he's put into you. And I want to activate them today. Multiplication. If you step into what God has for you, more people can step into what God has for them. You were made to be a missionary. Do you hear me? You were made to be a missionary, and you were made to multiply.